so let's uh, continue our discussion on uh, reducing the logical effort right that's where we were that's where we were last class and last two classes in fact so uh, basically to summarize what we have discussed till now is a static cmos logic is like this there is a pmos pull up network there is an nmos pull down network and right and the output is in between the two then in order to reduce the logical effect of course the same inputs go to both right this has very high logical effort because of the pmos block therefore we said let us take the pmos block off completely keep a pmos transistor which is on always however this has to be a weaker transistor than the nmos right and you have only a pull down network right this is my static cmos in the, today's class i'll tell you why this is called static cmos right because we have something called a dynamic logic later so this is a pull down network and beside that this is called pseudo nmos because it's mainly nmos logic we have just one pmos transistor pmos is really not used to implement any logic function right therefore it's called pseudo nmos logic or ratioed circuit ratioed circuit because unless the ratio of wp by wn is correct this circuit cannot even function right so problem is vol is greater than 0 right wp by wn is all as proportional to vol so this ratio is critical and therefore it's called a ratioed circuit right and of course there is also another problem there is static current when the pull down network is active because the pmos is always turned on right so to, in order to overcome this problem we came up with the idea of implementing a cascode voltage switch logic we just said that all you have to do is have two pull down networks of course you have more area now on one side you implement the function f on the other side you implement the function f bar then the the opposite side of where you know the pmos and nmos are fighting will ensure that that output is logic low and therefore it will just turn off the pmos transistor and prevent any static current right this is called c v s l logic right problem is of course you require yeah require a and a bar to be available and no doubt you have more area in general okay so there are certain advantages in this and it's useful in certain places but you are doing this at the penalty of throwing in more transistors and hence more area and also therefore more power okay so you just have to keep these disadvantages in mind you get y no y bar and y okay so what i really want to do now is i want the benefits of you know the cvsl logic but i still don't want to put in so many transistors okay it turns out that that is possible by doing what is known as dynamic circuits so let us just quickly look at you know what is the philosophy behind a combinational circuit suppose i have an input making a transition here and then here and then here the output will follow 
with some delay, it will follow exactly this. Right? The point being that I can make a transition at any point in time and my static CMOS circuit will respond with some delay. Right? But most of the time, the, what we have is you have a system which is going to be, you have inputs, uh, primary inputs, primary outputs and you are also going to drive it with a clock phi. Right? There is basically going to, you are going to have flip flops which are going to sample the inputs, hold the input constant du during the clock. Then you can evaluate and you have some implicit constraints are there on when the input can make transition so that the outputs will appear without any error. Implicitly these constraints are there in a system. So why not we exploit those constraints? Okay, that's the basic uh, philosophy here. The second thing is if this input made a transition and this steady state value just remain forever, okay, then this steady state value would also remain forever. As long as my power supply is connected, both of them will remain in that state forever, right. These two conditions we are going to exploit and we are going to compromise so that we get better logical effort but do away with all those problems that we had in the pseudo NMOS circuit or the CVSL logic. Okay. So what we do here is instead of my pseudo NMOS logic which was simply connected to ground, right, the gate was connected to ground always, pull down network. I say don't connect it to ground but connect it to the clock. Fine. Okay, I have a clock in the system anyway, I am going to connect it to that clock, right. So what happens here, my clock is going to look like this, okay, a realistic clock will have some finite rise time. What happens when my clock is zero? PMOS is turned. <laughs> on and therefore the output is y will be logic high correct so my y output is going to remain high here now let's assume that my pull down network never turns on okay the input combinations are such that they never turn on okay there is no transition happening my primary in my inputs are he there here right some different number of inputs and it turns out that the pull down network is never activated the input never makes a transition so what will happen the moment my clock turns off or, or goes high what will happen to a pmos transistor yeah it's going to be off so what if the pull down network is never going to be turned on in that state based on that assumption and the PMOS also now turns off, what state is my output in? High impedance or it is going to float. So I will represent high impedance by a dotted line. Now question is will this be at VDD always? Clearly the answer is no because now there is a leakage path through the pull down network. Right? Let me replace this pull down network with something that we know. I am going to connect it to a single NMOS transistor A. Right? I am going to make an inverter. So this I will connect here. Let us say this is the pull down network. Dynamic inverter is what I am constructing. Right? Clearly, <coughs> let me and what are the sizes now? NMOS will be? NMOS should be how much? Huh? Half. Why? No, no. So, okay. Let us assume that the minimum size is 1. Yeah. So, it is 1. 
Similarly, this PMOS size we'll fix later. Okay. So now there is a leakage path. When I say output Y is floating, there is a leakage path through this NMOS transistor through the subthreshold leakage. And therefore, strictly this VDD will actually drop slowly with time. Until the next clock comes, I mean the next falling edge comes and takes it back to VDD. So here, this will again go back to VDD. Right? This is high impedance. So why is this circuit called a dynamic circuit? Because when my clock goes high, that is when I am going to allow the circuit to evaluate the particular logic. Okay, these two clock phases I am going to call as pre-charge and evaluate. In the pre-charge phase, all the, that the clock is doing is taking the output to 1. In the evaluate phase, the clock is turning off and it will allow the pull down network to pull the logic low if necessary, depending on the input combination there. Right? So the circuit, instead of being a com regular combinational circuit where it can evaluate in any phase of the clock, we are now putting a restriction that this circuit can work only in one phase of the clock. That is when the clock goes high. Okay, so why is this called dynamic now? Let's assume that I slow this clock down sufficiently. I make the clock period 1 hertz, right? 1 second I'm going to, you know, my time period is 1 second. Clearly, in 1 second, this output y, even though my input is 0, right? My output is supposed to be 1 forever, correct? But because the time period is so large, it can leak out and the output eventually can go below. If you just allow this to go on and on, it will eventually go below the threshold of the, you know, of a gate, VTN and then it will effectively become logic zero. So it's called a dynamic circuit because the output is dynamically floating on a capacitor and you can evaluate it only in a particular period of time. Static CMOS logic will hold its value as long as the power supply is on, even if you, even if your clock is down to a frequency of 1 hertz. So that's why that is called static logic and this is dynamic logic. Okay? Yeah. No, no, that's why that's the whole point of doing this exercise was to get rid of my PMOS logic because I want to reduce logical effort. If I pre discharge to ground and pull up through the PMOS logic, I'm just losing that entire advantage. NMOS inherently is smaller with for the same drive strength. Therefore, I have to do only pre charge and then pull down logic. In this example, both are off. Ah, so like there will be leakage from VDD to, to output, right? Correct. Absolutely. Like Absolutely. So you must be very careful because again you have to size this correctly. Now the logic is why should I size my PMOS transistor if that's not going to take part in the logic evaluation? I will make that also one. So you are right. There will be some sort of a fight of leakage between these two. And since the NMOS is now going to be stronger, right, it will be closer to zero. That's it. You are right. Okay. So if we make the PMOS a little stronger, then even if evaluate phase comes, like the voltage increases, it will be still on. Yeah. Correct. That's true. Okay. So now let's consider, you know, this dynamic inverter again, but we'll 
now allow the input to switch a little bit. So this is my clock five. So let's say my output, my input, right? So this is again pre-charge evaluate, pre-charge evaluate. Let's say my input was zero and in the evaluate phase, it went high. Okay, this is my input transition. So how will the output Y now look like? In the pre-charge phase, A is turned off. There is no problem, right? So therefore, my output is going to be logic high. Now, at this point, my clock is turning off. So between point one and two, what will be the state of the output? High impedance. High impedance. So I'm going to represent that by a floating line. Of course, assuming that this is you know reasonably close, you know fast time, it will not fall too much. I'm assuming it's going to be very close to VDD, right? Now the input is going high. So what will happen to the output? It can fall, yeah, right? It will fall like this, and then remain until the next pre-charge phase comes. Correct? this. So now, what is the problem that you see here first of all? Both are on. So in the pre-charge phase, I have a constraint that the input cannot be high. The pull down network should not be active. Right? So for that, what I do is, I just add another transistor here called a footer transistor. Collecting the same clock. So when the clock is zero, it's in pre-charge phase, PMOS will be turned on and the NMOS will be turned off. Okay, this is my footer device and this is my, let's call it a header device. The NMOS transistor, footer NMOS is off during the pre-charge phase, right? It's the PMOS that is turned on. Therefore, now input A can be any value because there is no path to the to ground because I have cut off that series path, right? And therefore, here there will be no problem, okay? If, if there is... footer device. Clear? Now, I will give you another interesting scenario. Let us say that this input went high and then it fell here. What will happen to the output here? Yeah? So the output is zero, right? When input A went high, output went to zero. Now my input fell. There is no path to pull that Y up back to VDD. And therefore this will just remain at zero, right? So there is a very serious constraint here that this kind of a circuit can tolerate only a rising input, right? Or a falling output. You have to design your circuit so that the inputs during the evaluate phase do not switch in the other direction. 
it can go from low to high no problem but the input cannot go from high to low right so what i'm saying is suppose my input a was like this right with a footer device during pre charge my input a can be high no problem right and then my clock sort of turns off the uh, <coughs> header device and it goes to evaluate phase what will happen immediately my output y which was 1 will fall right so if this is high like this and let's say it falls somewhere in between as soon as this clock goes high this will result in the output falling now my input after some delay falls but nothing can pull my output back high therefore this transition is not allowed okay input cannot fall in eval phase okay so therefore of course it's very clear that it can be used only in certain conditions certain constraints if you have no control over the inputs and you have to guarantee that the circuit works for any transition well you cannot use this style of logic use the static semos logic you have lower logical effort and you have those problems but at least logically it will work so under the constraints where you are able to impose these conditions like in a dram circuit the place where these circuits is used quite often is a dynamic random access memory circuit i won't have time to like show you exactly what happens but it's effectively this dynamic nor gate is what gets used in a dram memory in those places i can impose these constraints and therefore use the logic and therefore it's very fast okay